which I'm doing. Um, and I will then, um, I'm now going to pass over to um, our very wonderful specialist, um, who everybody knows, Tamara Vershinska. Thank you, Deborah. Um, it's a great pleasure to see all of you today with us. And it's a special honor uh, to see and greet Aaron, Aaron Belsky, the youngest of the Belsky brothers. I don't think Aaron needs an introduction, but I would like to say something. Aaron, or Archuk, as he was called in the family, he was the 12th, he is the 12th child in the Belsky family of Bela and David Belsky. When the Nazi occupation began, Aaron was 13. Tuvia was 22 years older. To all the brothers, Aaron was their little brother and a scout and a liaison between the brothers in the forest. Aaron published his memoirs in 2014, a, the book under the title Forest Scout. His memoirs are preceded by a message to all, and this message reads, love as much as you can, be a warrior, be always in the truth, pray, be a warrior again. I'm giving word to Aaron. Hendrika, please unmute your microphone. Who you are. Okay. Hello, it's nice to see you. <laughs> yes, well, you say everybody. You say whatever you want to say about your past, about what? Who about you what? are, you have to introduce who you are, not that <laughs> everybody knows. <laughs> okay. <My name. coughs> Excuse me, my name. <coughs> <coughs> my name is Aaron Belsky. Uh, when you was born, when you was born, when you was born, you speak it. When I was born? Yeah. Thank you. White Russia. White Russia, but where? Where they call the village? Stankevich. You were in Stankevich, okay. And what? Aaron, what do you have to say to everybody? Because people who are with us today, they all came to hear about the Belskis. Okay, what do you want to say to everybody? Who you are, what is your family? What uh, do your father say? What do your father say? My father. Okay, say it. Uh, well, I come from a very tough family. We were all, you know, Jews that are not liked so much. But they loved us because they were afraid of us. The Goyesh Kevelt, the Gentile world, was afraid of us not to start up with us because they know they'll start up, will be their end. We simply, I guess with the help of God, whatever, it's hard to tell really, but we're very unusual, we were a very unusual, strong and tough family. What you, the world start what was going on? What the world start? What your father say? You young? <laughs> Run to the woods. You know the woods better than anybody. You'll survive the war is not forever. That's what he said. What do you, okay. What well, he was doing in the forest? Well, uh, 
What did I do in the forest? A good question. Everything, whatever I was told. I was pretty, I was good. I guess, I don't know, the help of my brothers probably. I looked at that. They were very powerful individuals. <clears throat> what else can I tell you? I did whatever. <clears throat> Well, Whatever thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Aaron, very much. I'm going today to speak about the Belsky brothers. And then you will add what you have to add, okay? Okay. okay. So please let me now mute. Let me now speak about the Belsky brothers. Well, last time Shifra Pupo, a guide from Yad Vashem, and uh dear colleague, introduced you to the history of Novogrudok Jews and guided through the exhibition of the Jewish Resistance Museum in the part dedicated to the tunnel and the escape. Today, we are going to talk about another incredible story that has no parallel in the history of the Holocaust, namely that of the Jews who not only chose resistance as a means of survival, in the face of total extermination, but who also cared for other Jews. It's a story about 1,200 people, each having their own story. It's a story which goes beyond individual stories and beyond time because of the lessons it has. According to Dov Cohen, a Belsky partisan, the Belskis were unique. They were Jews who served in other partisan units. But the history of the Holocaust knows of no purely Jewish partisan unit on this scale. The decision and actions of Tuvia Belsky, his brothers, and those who supported them were of national significance. Dov Cohen, may his memory be blessed, arrived in Israel on the Exodus, worked for the Israeli Ministry of Defense, first in the military police investigation department, and then in the Department of Morality. We can surely rely on his words. Cohen was the last chair of the Association of Novogrudokas in Israel among the generation of survivors. It was the largest Jewish partisan detachment in Europe. More than 1,000 people in July 1944. Jews from all over Belarus joined the Belskis. Novogrudok, Lida, Ivye, Mir, Voronova, Ivinet, Slonim, and many other places. Lebelsky gave the number 1,230 partisans in his book Yehuda Yar, published in Israel in 1946. Who were those people? Why did they manage to succeed? What factors proved cru critical to, the, to their success? Was there anything special about Novogrodov Jews? I believe a separate lecture is needed to answer each of these questions. The more we delve into details, more these and many other questions arise, including why remarkable deeds of ordinary Novogrudok Jews haven't been properly acknowledged either in Belarus or in the world. Let's start with general characteristics. Who do we mean when we say Belsky partisans? Sula Wolozinski, a Belsky partisan who wrote in her book Against the Tide, the backbone of the resistance was not those educated Jews, but the salt of the earth, ordinary people from the town and the village. They didn't philosophize about how to save themselves or how long the war would last. They did not waste time in idle arguments, but acted to outwit the enemy. Let's keep in mind when thinking about the Belsky partisans, what Sula said. The detachment was organized in June 1942, and operated until liberation in July 1944. They were people of all ages, men and women. The percentage of women in the Belsky detachment was the highest of all partisan units in Belarus. 364 women or 35.7% out of the total of 1,018 people. 
According to the last partisan list from January 17, 1944, besides there were six children uh, with them in the forest. This is the map, the map of the Naliboki forest. Polsky partisans had camps in different places during the two years of their partisan life. But uh, their long-term most developed camp was situated in the Nalibuki forest. If you look at this map, you will see a blue star of David in the very middle. Jerusalem, as local people called it, was situated in the very heart of the Nalibuki natural reserve. On the edge of the forest lie former shtetls, Ivye, Yuratishki, Vishnivo, Volozhin, Tershai, Rakov, Ivenets, and Lukcha. What is the Nalibaki forest like? Some of you were there two years ago. The Nalibaki forest is one of the largest forested areas in Belarus, and according to some sources, even in modern Eastern Europe. This vast space of 140 to 240,000 square kilometers is a unique in its composition, whole massive of bogs and forests which occupy nearly 82% of its territory. 23 rivers flow through this area. The valleys uh, of the rivers Berezina, Isloch, Volka, and Usa were heavily marshy until 1970s. Due to its difficult accessibility and poor soil fertility, the Nalibaki forest has always been sparsely populated. A few villages and hamlets have survived in the area, including Rubizhevichi, Naliboki, Potashnya, and Kretishche. During World War II, the, uh, the forest was home to five partisan brigades, 4,500 partisans, among which Jewish partisans under Tuvyabelsky and Shalom Zorin, were a special phenomenon. The organizers of the Belsky detachment, the Belsky brothers, were born in a small village of Stankevichi. Just 16 houses in the village situated in the Novogrudo district. The village was surrounded by forests. Therefore, the brothers were familiar with the forest from their childhood. Soil, the youngest Aaron, were especially well acquainted with the area. The Belsky family had a mill. This business provided a living for the family of 14, had 12 children, and a wide circle of acquaintances, which enabled them to escape the ghetto and survive the first winter of the Nazi occupation by hiding with their Belarusian and Polish friends. There's no village of Stankevich today, there's nothing left of the Belsky Mill. Aaron visited this place two years ago. The Belsky Detachment, a family group of first 14 and then 23 people, actually emerged in June 1942. Although Tuvia Belsky refers to the beginning of the detachment as December 1941, January 1942. The Belsky detachment began with two families, the Belsky and the Dzinchorsky, settling in a dugout, the Botskovichi forest, Novogrudok district. Zeus lost his wife, a daughter, in the first massacre in Novogrudok in December 1941, so he was alone. Soil was not married yet, he was alone. Archik was a teenager. Haibe, a sister, came to the forest with her husband, Aaron Dzinchorsky, their, uh, their year and a half old daughter Lola, and her husband's family, parents and sister Haya, Haya Belsky, Haya Dzinchorsky Belsky later. Their aim was to survive. Tuvia was 35 when the Nazi occupation of Belarus began. The war caught him in the town of Lida. He had two years of military experience in the Polish army, was released in the rank of corporal, and was not bound by any political doctrine. His brothers were already hiding when he reached Stankevichi. 
its total persecution and extermination of Jews, Pierre Belsky, according to Nehama Tech, a sociology professor, the author of Defiance, here serves as a model that demonstrates the link between self-preservation and selfless protection of others. When the chaos of collapse of an established society reigns, those who are independent and away from the mainstream can see hope where there is none, argues the author of Defiance. To Belsky, the commander of the Jewish partisan detachment, put the task of saving Jewish lives, not only relatives, but of any Jew, in the first place, and raised the value of life as such when total annihilation of Jews was underway. He refused to accept devaluation of life and dehumanization of Jews, thus acting in harmony with the core value in Judaism, although being not very religious himself. Pierre's words, I didn't want to kill Germans and certainly not accidental Germans. What was the point in that? The war was going on at the front. I only wanted to save as many people as possible, only to save. The very saving was our victory. His words are well known. He was very clear in his intention. What is our purpose here? To save ourselves. If we can save one more Jew from the Nazis, we will do it. Even if there are 10,000 Jews, we will find food. The three brothers complemented each other and always worked hand in hand, supporting each other in spite of the fact that they, especially Zeus, didn't completely share Tobias's mission. Here is how Dov Cohen characterizes the two brothers. Soil led operations, everyone loved the soil. He was kind and easygoing and always willing to listen to the problems of others. Soil was a courageous fighter and his men willingly followed him, often risking their lives. He always set a personal example by walking ahead. I saw him in different situations, the fire, attacking and retreating. He was always calm, never lost control. He understood the development of the battle well and had the ability to deceive the enemy, avoid traps and ambushes and attack where we were least expected. He knew the terrain well and led his men with confidence. His deep hatred of the Nazis drove him to avenge the ongoing murders of his Jewish brothers. He loved his people with all his heart and soul and fought bravely to protect them. Zuzbelski differed from his brothers in temperament. Unlike his brothers, he was not reserved and not reasonable, rather the opposite, hot and passionate. He had a frightening influence on local peasants. The peasants were afraid of him. He knew the area and the local peasants very well, Dov Cohen said about Zeus. He did not hesitate to use weapons against Jews either. Konstantin Kozlovsky, Konstantin Kozlovsky, whom you see on the screen, was a contact between the Belsky group and the ghetto in Novokudo. This connection was facilitated, in fact, by three families, the Bobrovsky family, the Buinsky family, and the Kozlovsky family. Konstantin was a faithful Belarusian friend from the pre war time. And his brothers, Mikhail and Alexander, were with him, helping the Belskys. They lived on a farm, Sofiyufka, close to the village of Makretz, which was a few kilometers from Stankevich. Kozlovsky delivered the first letter from Tuvia to the ghetto in Novogrudo. The letter was addressed to his cousin, Yehuda Belsky. The letter read, hey, Yehuda, we are hiding in the forest, and we do not plan to submit to the Germans. Bring your wife, a few good men, and we will build something together. Please do not hesitate. I hope to see you soon in the forest. Kozlovsky House soon became known to all those who fled various ghettos and wanted to reach the Belsky detachment. The first group of 10 people fled from the Novogrudo ghetto 
arrived in the forest after the second mass execution of Jews on August 7, 1942 in Novogrodov. The group was led by Yehuda Belsky, who had served in the Polish army in the rank of lieutenant when Ge Germany attacked Poland in 1939. He had been wounded near Warsaw, managed to escape captivity and return to Novogrodov. Among the others were Pesach Friedberg, Judah Levin, Israel Yankilevich, Arke Lubchansky, Motke Shmulevich. Yehuda's military exp expertise played an important role in the organization of the Belsky Partisan Detachment. He understood the necessity of subordination to one person under war circumstances. Immediately upon their arrival, they had a meeting during which they decided upon the structure of their group. Julia was nominated commander. The group took the name of Marshal Zhukov, a distinguished Soviet commander. Soil became second in command. Zuse was responsible for gathering intelligence information. Isaac Friedberg and Israel Yankelevich were staff members. This historic meeting laid the foundation for the rescue of 1,200 Jews. Yehuda Belsky called for revenge and revenge again on the murderers. No wonder the newcomers had lived through two slaughters in Novogrodov, which, uh, after which only a handful of Jews survived from the community of 6,000. He did mercilessly revenge betrayal and murder of the Jews during the whole period of their partisan life. Because this was one of the conditions for their survival. By the end of August 1942, the detachment grew to 80 people at the expense of those who had fled from the ghetto in Novokudok and was divided into platoons. The number of partisans kept increasing as the Jews fled from the ghettos in nearby cities and villages, Novogrodok, Lida, Slonim, Kivye, Baranovici, Zatlava, Dvorets, Naliboki, and Lukcha. By November 1942, the Belsky detachment had grown to approximately 250 people and was incorporated as the second company into the Russian partisan detachment called Oktyabrsky Leninskaya Brigade. Yet they remained pretty independent and had to take care of themselves. Nobody provided them with anything. As the winter of 1942-43 was approaching, it was decided to build two winter bases in the neighboring forest, one in Perelaz and the other in Zabelovo, near Stankevichi. Several dugouts for 20-25 people each were built at each base. That winter was very severe in every sense. From December 42, when the punitive operation Hamburg began, to April 15, 1943, their camps were attacked twice. Husky partisans had to leave warm dugouts and move away from the persecution. They were scattered, dispersed in small groups throughout the neighborhood, which threatened the very existence of the detachment. You can see here on the map, three blue stars of David. And they show three different places where the Baskis camped. In the spring, summer of 1943, Julia took a number of steps to bring prisoners from the leader ghetto to the forest and transferred his Jews to the Lipichansky forest. The unit's total strength grew to 750 people. There are not many details in testimonies and memoirs about partisan life in the forest. The history of the detachment, written by Shmuel Amarant, the historian of the Utrecht, unfortunately didn't survive. The more valuable source of information are sketches by Peretz Shershati. Paul Sheinwald, as his original name before he came to Israel after the war, a refugee from Poland, arrived into the forest having escaped from the Lida ghetto. Here is a moment of his arrival, April 1943. Escapees from the ghetto crossed the roaring river. With anxiety, I approached the unit commander Zuse, Belsky's brother, and asked to let me join 
So we see Zeus on horseback. Jewish Belsky partisans were subordinate to the Russian partisan command. On the order of the higher command, they participated in joint missions together with partisans from other detachments. Among covert operations of the Belsky family detachment were six derailed trains carrying ammunition and enemy manpower a combat unit of 140 men called Arjunikidze Otrad, allocated by the order of the higher command on June 19, 1943, blew up two locomotives and 23 vehicles. Pavel Sheinwald, who participated in those missions, accompanied his sketches by short explanations. We need to plant an explosive and hide it in order to mislead the scouts who are checking their railway before the train passes. During the fancy on the front, partisans attacked the railway line needed by the German army, destroying it, blowing it up all at night in a short time, in collaboration with dozens of partisans. Others called German soldiers their positions. Sabotage on the railway. In front of the locomotives, there is a platform with bags full of sand. German defensive unit is attacking an ambush of a group of Russian paratroopers, amongst which are a couple of Jewish partisans. I am one of them. Here you can see a partisan who participated in most of the missions on the railroad. Jakob Bergman, may his memory be blessed, was involved uh, in many combat operations. The photo in the center was taken after liberation in 1944. During one of his visits to Novogrodok, Jankel said that he had a trophy at home in Jerusalem, a leather coat he had taken off a German officer after a successful mission at Yatsuki station. The photo on the left shows Yakov in that very coat. I believe it is still the family. From July 14 to August 15, a whole month, 1943, the detachment of Tuvia Belsky survived the siege of the Nalibaki forest during the largest German punitive operation against partisans, codenamed Hermann. Five partisan brigades, about 4,500 people, over 700 of whom were partisans of Tuvia Belsky's detachment, were encircled by the combined German punitive forces with a total strength of 52,000. Big hand, we wander in search of a shelter. The Germans are already close, we hear voices. Then we go into a large swamp. A thousand Jews stretched out in one line for kilometers. They survived on a small hill called Krasnaya Gorka, surrounded by swamps, and didn't lose a single person. When the blockade was over, they returned to the Nalibaki forest. That was October, October 1943. They had one month built a new camp before winter comes. Dr. Shmuel Amarad, historian of the camp, wrote, the camp was located in the heart of the Nalibaki wilderness. Around it were hundreds of square kilometers of forests and marshes. The whole area was a partisan country, a territory under the Soviet rule, surrounded by the Nazi enemy. All that large area was under the control of the partisan commands which were growing, they ruled and directed all that was happening in that area. It is there at the beginning of 1944, the family group was finally separated from the Orjunikidze, it was officially called Belsky Partisan Detachment. The beginning of 1944. Here you can see the order from January 4, 1944. It was written in the Nalibaki Forest. Paragraph one, as of this date, 
family group attached to the Orjuni Kids Partisan Detachment is transformed into an independent Belsky Partisan Detachment. Paragraph two, I am appointed detachment commander. Paragraph three, Lazar Malbin is appointed chief of staff. Paragraph four, Angel Gordon is appointed acting deputy commander for political affairs. Commander of the detachment, Belsky. We will always be together. We will be safe together. We will die together. This is what distinguished Tuvia Belsky from other Jewish and non-Jewish partisan commanders. It is that what made him father of every partisan and gave everybody hope that everything will end well. Psychologists and sociologists argue that those who are independent and free from social constraints and believe a better future, easily transfer their hopes, their opportunities, their success to less confident. This transformation creates a new reality that confronts the environment. The new reality created by Tudor Belsky in the forest transformed people. The fear that accompanied them everywhere in the ghetto disappeared. In addition to freedom, guarantee that they would not starve to death. Minimal protection, they have provided people with something equally important, the opportunity to fight, become rescuers, protect themselves and help others. Strict discipline was important for our survival. It was not easy to obtain absolute obedience from our Jewish brothers, said Bob Cohen. Leonardo Juncevich, a Polish resident of Nalibaki village, said he was a famous partisan. It seems he, has, he was a hard man for his own people. He held the Jews with a firm hand. They were afraid of him. The Poles of the farms too. They especially trembled those who had Jewish goods. Pavel Sheinwald was punished for leaving the detachment on his own with a group sent on a mission. Well, they had a prison in the camp for such cases. Punishments were severe, sometimes with a death uh, sentence, especially when it endangered the whole detachment. Yet for all its discipline, there was an unusual pluralism of opinion and freedom of expression for both men and women, unusual for the Soviet system and wartime in particular. They had two hospitals in the forest with a staff of 27 doctors and nurses. One of them was an infection ward for patients with typhoid. There was also a surgery and a dentist. Dr. Hirsch took supervision over the medical service when Dr. Isler, who had been previously in charge, joined the fighters after the Orgenikidze detachment had been split into the fighting and family groups. Dr. Isler and his wife Rivka saved the patient's hand with a pocket knife heated on fire without anesthesia and without medicine, using only leaves of plants. That's what Pavel Shainwell wrote. A typhus epidemic broke out in the detachment in the spring of 1944. Pavel Shainwell was one of them. Typhoid patients in a remnant dugout. There are no medicines. They sleep naked on straw. They are guaranteed for 21 days, either or. A convalescent gets up staggering, hungry, hungry. I am up. That's how he survived. During the whole period of his existence, the Belsky detachment lost approximately 50 people. The last seven people died on July 9, 1944 when retreating Germans broke into the camp. On July 10, 1944, having buried the dead, the Belsky partisans left the camp in the Nalibaki forest and headed for Novogrudok. The Belsky dismissed his detachment in the outskirts of the town. 991 Jews received partisan certificates and participated 
is the joint parade of the Castle Hill in Novogudok, which took place on July 16, 1944. Evgeny Andrejcik, the only Belsky partisan who lived in Belarus in the last years, he died last December. He was six years old in 1944, his picture on the right. Evgeny visited the camp a month before his death. It was the place where he, his mother and sister realized for the first time since the Nazi occupation began that they will stay alive. His greatest wish was to see a memorial to the Jews who resisted and fought back. Let him, his mother and sister, the thousand more Jews, live long, decent and full lives. Thank you. Great, Tamara, thank you so much for that presentation. Um, I would like to introduce everyone now to Ruth Bielski Elric. Is Ruth, is your microphone working? I believe it is, you tell me. Is ah, it working? Fantastic, perfect, perfect. <laughs> Ruth, thank Lovely. you so much uh, for My coming pleasure. tonight and, and joining us. I just wanna remind everybody that you are the daughter of Tuvia and Lika Bielski, sister of Michael and Robert. You are currently living in Florida, USA, and yeah. um, apparently most proud of being a mother and grandmother. So thank you so much for joining us and thank I'll you. hand the, the mic over to you. Well, <laughs> Tamara, you're a tough act to follow. You covered everything. Now, what am I supposed to be saying? I think I can add a little bit. Yes, this was a, um, this was a time period that far surpassed any of the people who survived imagination. I think that they were called to do things that they never imagined were a possibility. And that the story as it unfolded and the people as they survived also managed to do the impossible. Um, there's lots of history behind there, but I think that um, at this time, I would prefer to talk a little more about the current times and how important it is for us to remember what happened. Out of that time period came out a saying that's been used commonly and often, never again. But I think of late, in light of what is happening in the world, not only to Jews, but the genocide that is taking place as we speak in other countries, of course, I'm speaking about the Ukraine, really tells us, for those of us who are following, that never again is a lot closer than we think. And so I think that we need to reevaluate what never again means and to redouble our efforts, to become very conscious of what, what is happening in the world. And I, as an individual, even though I've always admired and been in absolute amazement at what all these partisan people did, from the leadership to just the plain survival of the people, I think that we need to use that as a lesson now more than ever, because the crimes of humanity are not only continuing, but they are getting larger, more aggressive, and it's no longer never again. Uh, that is something that, you know, personally, I, it's very difficult. What do you do? How do you do it? Most of the time we think that one person can hardly contribute to make a difference. But I think if organizations such as these um, and others, uh, we're on a world stage at the moment, look at the people that we're talking to and the countries that they're from, the ability of technology strengthens and has the power to give us direction and action for the future 
So indeed, never again does not happen again. I am worried that we are dangerously close to never again. And I think that it's wonderful to be able to use perhaps the lessons of the authentic past as direction for our futures. Um, one of the other things that is happening is as the survivors are diminished, there are very few of them who are still alive. I'm finding that the narrative of the Holocaust is starting to change. And I find that to be disturbing as well. And without dwelling on a lot of it, I think it's very important that we not only remember and teach, but that we um, understand and try to do everything that we can to make sure that the story, particularly our story, stands authentic in perpetuity. And that is not an easy task. Many people have written about the Holocaust, people who have no idea about the Holocaust. Of course, there are the ones that don't even believe that the Holocaust happened. But there are many authors who are writing about the Holocaust who have had no experience in Holocaust at all. And so the narrative is changing. And I think we have to keep uh, vigilant about that as well for the future. I am always excited and honored to be a part of a group who's willing to take action because, you know, as one, we can do little things, but together we can make a difference. And um, so I urge, you know, everyone who is on this committee panel, whatever it is, let's figure out what we want to do. Let's take a lesson from the partisans and let's somehow pass it on teach it to the future because we are the gatekeepers now. The third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth generations are the gatekeepers of the Holocaust story. So we must do everything we can to keep it authentic and in perpetuity. Thank you. Ruth, thank you for thank you. sharing your thoughts and those wise words. Um, is Asela? Asela. There, there. Hello. Hey, hello. 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 And it's a soil turned to a feminine. So it's Asaela. Asaela, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm so glad your microphone is working this time. Yes, it is. It is <laughs> we fine. wouldn't want to miss out on that. Yeah. So um, welcome. I just want to quickly introduce you to everyone. Um, to remind everyone, you are the daughter of Asal Bielski, um, who unfortunately never had a chance to meet his infant daughter as he was killed shortly after um, the camp was liberated and went on to fight. However, thanks to your mother, Chaya, you grew up here in Israel and you worked for many years as a journalist on the military radio, uh, newspapers and the editor of a children's weekly magazine. You are most <coughs> proud of being a mother and grandmother and currently live in Tel Aviv. So, Bless you. Oh, um, <laughs> if everyone could please remember to mute yourselves while we listen to Asela. So it's Asaela. It's, it's a Asa biblical name and very strange. I mean, for uh, a Russian uh, family, a Belarusian family, uh, to have a name like Asoel, Asael. So uh, I'm very proud of this name. I wasn't when I was a child, but I am now. Uh, well, I, I must say a few things. First of all, it's wonderful that you got us Bielski cousins together. Mm -hmm. We haven't done it. We could do it ourselves. Ruti and Robert and Bella and Uncle Archik. I mean, why don't we do it? It's <laughs> wonderful to, it, it's a great uh, opportunity for us to get together and see one another. We are aging too, and it's wonderful. So thank you for the opportunity. And I must uh, say something to Tamara. Tamara, this is a wonderful uh, historical 
chronology that you got. It's beautiful. I must get it because when uh, I got my information from my mother as a child, uh, all the Bielski uh, partisans used to get together very often, those who lived in Israel, uh, in our house, and they would sing and dance and, and talk and tell stories endlessly forever. But my information is so, um, I, I would say even romantic and funny because they always laughed, always sang Russian songs. So uh, I want to take it to a different um, uh, angle. Uh, and I would like to just say that to me, um, a soil and Chaya were, uh, were really the first ones to go into the forest. I think this is my own uh, view, point of view, uh, that the whole thing started because a soil was in love with a Chaya and she didn't, she refused to uh, to be his uh, uh, wife. This is before the war. And uh, he, she had other ambitions. He was a country boy, uh, simple, uneducated. She thought she would conquer the world. She would be a Hebrew teacher, etc., etc. Studied in Vilna. And she was the youngest of 11 children. Uh, and the family, the Dunchelsky family, was very similar to the Bielskis. Many boys, less girls, but uh, uh, living in, in, uh, in villages uh, where each family was the only Jewish family in, that in their village. And um, when war broke out and they realized they couldn't hide, they, my mother was never in the ghetto. She hid with uh, some of her uh, nephews uh, and then they couldn't stay with uh, the, the Polish uh, person who hid them. So my father used to come over and, and he said very simply, I'll save you, your family. I'll save you, your brothers, sisters, parents, <clears throat> If you if you are mine, if you are if you become my wife, and then uh, my grandfather Aaron Dinchelsky said, uh, "Well, among us in, in in Jewish families, you have to be married to become uh, to be a couple." And uh, Asoil gave Chaya uh, a revolver, and he said. This is it. it uh, we, you know, we all have in mind. I think the the film defiance. So it's unlike the film. There was no big wedding in the in the forest. But he gave her the revolver and said, "This will be your best friend for for as long as the war goes on, and the last bullet you must keep for yourself, so that you don't ever ever fall alive." in the hands of the, of the Germans. And so it was, uh, they uh, lived in the forest, of course, like everybody else. And, and um, I don't, I mean, fighting and, and th there's so much going on. There was uh, so much going on, but the main idea was to, uh, to, to leave, and to help others to get children. There were 60 children in the, in the partisan group in the Bielsk, among the Bielskis. And I remember a story, one of the kids, uh, a man told me that he was six when he came from the Lida ghetto and he, uh, somebody gave him an egg. They were so happy to see children in the forest. Somebody gave him a, one egg, but he didn't know what an egg was because in the ghetto there were no eggs. So he, he thought it was a ball, he threw it. And the, the egg fell down, of course, and, and there was no way to even enjoy it. So like the, the forest was uh, harsh, but it was funny. And I usually got the funny stories when I was a kid. Uh, I want to tell you about uh, Raya Kaplinsky, who was the 
uh, secretary of Tuvia. And she said, I once made a, um, recorded a program on, for uh, the military radio, Galei Tzahal, about the Bielskis. This was in 1975. So all of them were still around and happy and, and getting together all the time. And Raya said, it was such a beautiful time. The, the forest, the moon, the snow, we were so happy there. And this is how I see them. Happy and young and very, very capable and with their hearts in the, in, in, in the right place. Thank you, everybody. Well, dear Asayala, thank you so much. This is something, you know, this is something to have the Belskis here with us and to listen to your stories, really. Mamon Belsky, I, I'm sure there will be many questions when we finish with uh, our Belsky speakers. Mamon Belsky with us today is Bella, Bella Belsky Rubin, who is the daughter of Taiba Belsky, the sister of the Belsky brothers. Bella was born in a DP camp in Thurnwald, Germany. She lived with her family in the US, taught English as a second language at the City University of New York, Baruch College, Queens College, Hostess Community College, and at the World Trade Center. She also designed instructional materials using video and original photographs. Since she immigrated to, is, immigrated to Israel in 1970s, she was a senior lecturer and a researcher at Tel Aviv University in the field of academic reading and writing for over 30 years, working often with PhD students of all fields. After retirement, uh, Bella began doing research in Holocaust education and published widely in this field, as well as give memoir writing workshops to survivors and their descendants all over the world. Bella, I want a workshop with you. And please uh, tell your story, your parents' yes. story. Thank you, Tamara, for that lovely introduction and for inviting me. But I, I'm going to take things to another angle. Each one of us has our own way of telling our stories. And I just want to thank the people at the Together Plan. I saw your first the previous Zoom, which I found fascinating about the document, the research. So you're doing wonderful things. Um, I understood from Tamara that she wanted me to tell the story of my parents uh, who were actually not characters in the film Defiance. They're not, they don't exist there as characters. So very few people know about them and have a few interesting things to say about them. Um, I remember when I was very young, we were in, sitting in my father's car and um, on the way to a family affair, maybe a bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah or a wedding. And some people were sitting next to me, a couple, an elderly couple, Peshka and Mishulam Boldo, which is another family very connected to the Jintowski and Belsky family. Um, and uh, Peshka says to me in my ear, I'm going to speak in Yiddish and then translate it. Uh, let's see where the Yiddish is. Ah, she says, Du weist dein Tate hat uns geratet das Leben, which means your father saved our life during the war. I had no idea what she was talking about. I didn't see my father as a hero. Well, years later, I would learn that my father had a keen sense of direction. He couldn't read maps or street signs. Um, and he never asked people for directions to my knowledge. He simply found his way. Um, it's interesting because um, I'm named after my, I must say that I'm named after my Bailski grandmother, Bailey, okay? And um, he used to, um, his job in the camp actually was to guide escapees who were escaping from the Navaguda ghetto and some of the other villages, surrounding villages to find the Belsky camp. It, it was very difficult to find, especially since they moved from forest to forest. So that was basically his job. He knew how to use a gun, though I'm not sure he had one in, in his possession there. He did have one in his truck when he was doing his trucking work his, um, later in life. And he knew how to ride a horse. And he, the main thing was he knew the forest like the back of his hand. And uh, he was very useful in that sense. Um, 
So uh, my father was able to later when he had his small trucking business, he was self-employed. And as I said, he couldn't read maps, but he was somehow able to navigate going into very all the different states around New York, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Baltimore, Maryland. Somehow he worked it out. Nobody knows how. No one knows how he managed to get uh, a driving license in the United States because he couldn't <laughs> read or write. So uh, he may have had a uh, kind of dyslexia or other type of um, disorder that people call today learning disabilities or whatever. So um, when it came time for him to become a citizen after some years living in New York, my mother had to, he didn't know the history, he couldn't read about it. So my mother had these Polish books and she would read to him and he would memorize all the facts of American history. And he took the test and passed. So we're very proud of him. Anyway, when I first became aware of the Holocaust, um, I began to understand, begin to understand what my parents endured during that period in their lives. Though they never spoke to us directly or gave us factual information, somehow we were able to glean, my sisters and I, Charlotte and Lola, we were able to figure out, we had images, that we had jokes, as Asi mentioned, there were jokes passed around through the family meetings and, and um, um, get-togethers. But we never really knew what happened. It took Tamara to tell us really what happened. So um, when, when uh, it snowed in New York, the schools were closed and my father couldn't work with his truck. We would say to him, Tate, tell us the Tsagaina stories, the gypsy stories. Tsagaina means gypsies in English. And uh, he would talk about sitting around the campfire, very romantic. Uh, eating kartoffel potatoes. Uh, my sons today use the word kartoffel. It's amazing how they do it. Um, and um, just being in the forest that they loved. Um, they slept in Zimlankas, dug out wooden um, places for sleeping, which, we, which I think when, a couple of years ago when you invited us tomorrow, we actually went into the Naliboki forest, of course, and my two sons were with me, Shahan Uya. And we discovered all kinds of artifacts that we gave to the museum and may have discovered some of the Zimblancas or at least where they had been. So we knew all of that was true. My mother recalled often that um, her brother Tuvia rode around on a white horse, which I think is in the film, as I recall, very proud and um, very respected by all. And this is definitely a picture of two of you that I grew up with and still have. There was a sense of adventures in these stories. And um, for a moment, I could see my, my parents being as heroes, but this was not the reality of our growing up as immigrants in New York. Um, it was uh, our family struggle for many years and uh, just as other immigrants did, but we made it. Uh, I'm the only one that moved to Israel and there are many reasons for that, but I won't go into it now. Um, two years ago, as I said, my sons uh, came with me to the forest in uh, Belarus and we participated in a workshop that I gave to four generations. This was not planned, but it happened. The workshop was planned, but I didn't know there would be four generations there. There was my uncle Aaron and Enrica there. I'm sure they remember. There was Lola, my sister, who was a, a hidden child during the war. I want to tell you about her a little later if I have time. Uh, there was her grandson there and my son. So that's four generations. And um, I hope that uh, they'll continue to tell the sagas of the Belskis, the heritage that they have, have uh, come to have. Well, after I finished um, uh, retiring, I went into Holocaust studies uh, by accident, sort of. My sister Lola asked me to write her story for her. She was a hidden child. When my parents got to the forest, along with the other eight members of the family of the Nicholsky and uh, Boldo and um, uh, Bielski families, there were nine people actually. Um, they, uh, they didn't know what to do with my sister. She was about seven or eight months old. They couldn't keep her in the forest. Everything was very um, not planned in the beginning. Nobody knew the war would last so long. There were many rumors. Um, in the beginning, they only thought they were after the men, but that wasn't true, we found out. And that's why people fled to the forest uh, with their families eventually. 
So um, what happened was uh, she was given to a Polish couple that didn't have their own children. My father arranged all of this. We don't know their names really. Um, and uh, they promised to return her after the, after the war was over. Of course, we weren't sure if we would survive, they would survive. And they probably didn't believe my parents would survive. So when they did survive, my uh, sister had to be taken back by force. But they allowed uh, th this wonderful couple that took my sister in as their own child in a, loving, a very loving way. She wore a cross around her neck. She said her prayer, she spoke Polish. She loved going to church. And uh, they, they really took good care of her and she has very fond memories of them. So my father did allow, my parents did allow them to come and say goodbye before they left Poland. They, so they were able to say goodbye to their foster daughter. Well, afterwards, I um, decided, my sister asked me to write her story. Many people have told it, but she has never, she's never told it from her own perspective. So we came up with this little book. The stories are here printed in the Hidden Child Book Club. And uh, we, wrote most of her story while she came to Israel. We were sitting in a hotel at the Dead Sea, worked intensely on my computer. And we had a first draft when she went back to, his, to uh, the States, I finished it. And it got published in 2016. And it was presented at Temple Emmanuel on Fifth Avenue and very well received. We were on a panel and it was very exciting for both of us. And so I continued in this field. I was asked by um, the editor of a very prestigious journal called Prism, published by Yeshiva University, to write an essay. And it was a very challenging job. I was supposed to write about, she knew about the Belskis, of course, but uh, the idea was not to write about them, but to write about when I first understood what the Holocaust was. It was always there in our family, as Asi mentioned, all the get togethers, the jokes, the, the drinking, the, you know, they would say seltzer, have a drink with us. Uh, that was my father's name then. Um, but uh, uh, it was never formalized. So this is what she wanted me to write about. And uh, it came out, the article or the essay was called The End of Innocence. And this uh, picture that is being um, shared now is from, uh, printed in this uh, essay. This is from 1953, Uncle Zeus there is in the middle, Uncle Walter and Aunt Ruth on the right, on the left, Uncle Nathan, they, the two of them were there before the war in New York, and my mother and father in the center, and the children, uh, and Aunt Rose on the bottom, and lots of kids. So why am I showing this? Um, I want to show you how the Belskis were reunited. All the Belskis were reunited in New York, surprisingly. Some of them, of course, went to Palestine at first, but little by little, we all were reunited in New York. And with oh, very oh, strong so it's too long. Excuse me, Tamara. Uh, it's not me. Uh, someone else said something. One more minute, oh. Ella. One more minute. Excuse me. It's too long. One more minute. One more minute. Okay, <laughs> I'm at the end. So, um, and the other photo there. Uh, which you can show, I think I sent it to you. Can you share the small photo? That was taken in the Thornval DP camp. Well, I, I can share, oh, yeah, that's it. Thank you, Tamara. Um, there you see my mother in the middle holding me. I was only a few months old. I was one of the first children born in this Thornval camp in Germany. Uh, my father next to my mother, my grandmother on my, my mother's left. Um, um, mother's right, actually, uh, and uh, Aunt Rachel, and the other side is Asi's mother, and Asi. Asi and I are a few months apart. So it's a very charming photo, and I have the original, of course. There was a very nice photo shown by Tamara, I think, which I also have the original, where my mother, on the Stenkevich homestead, that was my mother standing there on the left, the tall lady, a girl, actually, she was a teenager, so this continued and I stayed in this field until now, still involved in it. Um, after all, Tuvia and the Belsky brothers and my parents had an incredible devotion to the family, incredible loyalty. And people ask me, how did they survive? Well, I think this is it. 
But there's one more thing that contributed to their survival. And that was their love for the forest. The forest protected them. It even nourished them. And um, it was their playground, the Belsky's playground. Today, one of my sons, Shahar, who is a professional photographer, has, has been living in a forest for almost six years in Israel. He's part of a group known as um, Shomrei Agan, which is an organization that teaches survival in nature to children, grand, um, teenagers and adults. And he's been doing this and it's self-fulfilling. Uh, I think the Belsky life is in the DNA. And my son, uh, Uya, is part of this in one way or another as well. So uh, I'm very proud to be a Belsky. And uh, I think my children are, and my grandchildren are beginning to ask questions too. So there I am, I can answer some of them. Thank you, Bella. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, you explained one thing which uh, is difficult to explain. How they manage, how did they manage in the forest? Mm. How did they succeed? Well, there, there was no a lot of help. How. There is yeah. no explanation how. You said your father didn't speak English, but he passed no. his exam. That's how, how <laughs> the bells did. Yeah, Nobody true. can explain, but they did it. Yeah. Well, uh, what about Belsky? She's not Belsky, but she is Belsky. Nance Adler, our dear speaker, is in her 17th year teaching at the Jewish Day School of Metropolitan mm -hmm. Seattle. Nance uh, is the Mashgir Ruhani, I'm sorry if I mispronounce, curator of values and Jewish learning at the JDC, as well as the middle school Judaics teacher. She teaches 3,500 years of Jewish history, sword writings and practice, to sixth, seventh and eighth grade kids. She is a recipient of the Rabbi's Dr. William Greenberg Master Teacher Prize. Nancy's speciality is the Holocaust, and she is a Museum Teacher Fellow, 2014 cohort at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, a Powell Fellow at the Holocaust Center for Humanity, and an ambassador for the Defiant Requiem Foundation. Nance has been teaching about the Belskis and other Jewish partisans since she uh, was introduced to their stories by the Jewish Partisan Educational Foundation. It happened 12 years ago. She was honored to be included. We were honored, Anne, Nance, to have you. Uh, at the first gathering of the Belsky partisans' descendants in 2019. Now, Nance continues with the Together Plan with all of us to help preserve and tell this important history. Welcome, Nance. Thank you so much, Tamara. Um, hoping I'll be able to, I need to be able to share my screen. So while we're getting that going, so Tamara said a little bit of what I was gonna say with my first slide in her introduction of me. Um, when I first learned about the Belsky Partisans, um, I was, uh, I'm still not able to share. Um, there we go, thank you. Um, I, when I first learned about the, the partisans um, about 12 years ago, um, I was, uh, very interested in this idea of Jewish resistance um, and wondered why it did not have more of a centerpiece in uh, Jewish history and teaching of the Holocaust. This was an especially important point for me because I teach to Jewish children and um, not just the Holocaust, but much of Jewish history can be um, very depressing for them. Um, and I wanted something that could use that history but turn it into something that would inspire my students to want to work to make sure that the events of the Holocaust didn't happen again to anyone, much like um, was earlier mentioned. Um, and teaching about Jewish resistance, particularly the Belsky partisans, who not only fought back but saved Jews of all ages, uh, was my answer. And since that time, the stories and lessons of these courageous uh, Jewish partisans has been central to my teaching. 
As a result of this passion for the partisans and connections made with other Jewish educators and Holocaust educators, as Tamara said, I was invited to the first reunion of Belsky partisan descendants in 2019. Um, and I was so excited to get to go to uh, Novogrodek and to the Nalabaki forest and see the camp and the woods and have my own pictures rather than trying to describe them to my students each year. Um, I met my first Belsky actually in the Minsk airport waiting for my ride when I discovered I was sitting next to Robert. Um, I informed him that in my classroom, his father and uncles were heroes. Um, upon arriving in Novogrodek, I met Aron and Henrika Bell, as well as I connected with Ellie Rabinowitz, who was already working with me to come to Australia and teach there about the partisans. We all got to know each other and enjoyed the hospitality of the priest who was in charge of the hostel where we were staying. Aaron and I bonded quickly and we continued to talk throughout the three days. So you've already heard about a couple of these young men. Um, this is my favorite picture from the trip. It was taken before I had met any of these Belsky descendants. Um, from the left is Lola's grandson, in the middle are Bella's two sons, and on the right is Tuvia's grandson. I like to think that they embody the spirit of their ancestors oh, in this shit. photo. And I can picture the train tracks blowing up behind them. Oria Rubin in particular welcomed me, and by the end called me Achot, sister. Which brings me to the title of my presentation, Partisan or Tunnel. Throughout the reunion, when I met someone new, they would ask, tunnel or partisan? Meaning, why are you here? What is your connection to this and to me? My answer each time was neither. I am a history teacher who's taught about the Belskis for 12 years. By the second day, I, became, I found out that I had become the famous American historian, but I actually preferred Achot. Prior to my visit, I had not been aware of the escape from Novogrodok, and I found the story so amazing and couldn't wait to bring it back to my classroom. I, had, I have added it now to my unit on resistance and my students have used the materials many put together by Tamara from the event, um, as well as my photos in their research and work on partisans. It was so inspiring to hear how the presence of the Belskis in the forest allowed many of those who escaped to survive because they had somewhere to go and to be safe. This photo is Aaron and Tamara speaking. It's Aaron speaking to the whole gathered group. And I clearly remember what Aaron said here and it's similar to what uh, Henrico was trying to get him to say at the beginning. He said, we were not the most educated or the smartest. We knew the woods and we knew how to live off of them. Our father told us go into the woods and survive and we did. This short statement makes clear that those who survived did so because of their familiarity with the era, area as Bella has mentioned, their knowledge of the land and the peasants in the area. This is true in story after story of Jewish partisans. We often think of Jews as urban and well-educated, but in Poland, Belarus, Ukraine, Lithuania, many of the Jews were peasants living in rural and heavily wooded areas and those woods saved them. On the second day, we journeyed to the site of oh, the Belsky okay. camp. It, in, it is near the village of Nalabaki. I was so taken in by the warm and traditional welcoming given by the town to this group of Jewish people who had descended from the Jews that used to live in their area that had largely been rounded up and murdered. This group of traditional singers and dancers welcomed us both on our way to the camp and afterwards. The mayor welcomed us with this amazing and beautiful loaf of bread it really was heartwarming to see how much the community wanted to make people who could have been their neighbors feel welcome. And speaking of what could have been, this is another one of my favorite photos, the one on the bottom. This is Oria Rubin in the bus stop in Nalabaki with a group of locals on their way to work or shopping. Oria asked me to take this photo when we talked about that this could have been his bus stop if things had been different. The other photo is from our second welcome by the group. Our own is standing with his back to us. This was before they served us a partisan lunch made with local food produce and including a very healthy dose of homemade vodka. The food was delicious and the welcome was honest and warm. 
When we went into the camp, I wandered off by myself. Whoops, sorry, wrong. Off the page here. Arriving at the camp was pretty emotional for me. I was really so excited to see this place that I had been teaching about. The sign on the right is at the entrance. On the left is a map of the camp created by a student of mine just a few months before my visit. The next fall, I showed this photo to the student who had made the map, and he was so excited to see what he had made in the place that it was a map of. When we got to the camp, I wandered off by myself. I wanted to be alone with my thoughts and discover this place in quiet. I wandered the whole length of the site and off the path as well. There was evidence of the use of this place to be found if you were looking closely. I found what is likely a small underground storage site as well as some metal artifacts. You could tell where the Zemlyankas, the underground bunkers, had been by looking carefully to see where the ground was sunken or where newer trees were growing. It was peaceful and still in the forest, and I was able to picture it as the place of refuge and safety that the Belsky camp provided. While we were at the site, I helped Sharon, Tuvia's granddaughter, put up a mezuzah on one of the trees along the main path. She had brought it with her on, her on a previous visit, but was unable to hang it due to rain. Lola and her grandson are pictured touching the mezuzah. That's the bottom right-hand picture. The most magnificent part of the visit was dancing and singing in the middle of the camp, a picture of uh, Bella and Shahar dancing, dancing with the remnants of the Jewish community from this area, watching the children and grandchildren of Jews who li whose lives had been saved in these woods dance and sing in Hebrew and Yiddish was such an amazing experience. It was an irrefutable statement of the failure of those who sought to annihilate us completely. It has been my intention to return to Nalabaki to help with the preservation and exploration of the campsite. This sadly has not been able to happen the last couple of years, but I'm hopeful I will be able to go soon. Meanwhile, my connection to this story is kept alive in my classroom. The bottom picture is uh, Lola and Bella with two of the women who worked in the kitchen who actually knew the family that um, had hid Lola. She was sharing pictures, which I think I'm holding in my hand. I work to pass on to the next generation the stories of the partisans and to use them to inspire my students to know that one person can make a difference, can save many lives, or maybe only one. But in Jewish teaching, one life is a whole world. My students learn about the struggles of the partisans, here are two fifth graders with a model of a Zemlanka that they made while learning about the Belskis for a Jewish heroes unit. My eighth graders learned that Jews did not all go like lambs to slaughter, but rather for people dehumanized, starved, and hunted, many fought back bravely, not just to save their own lives, but to interrupt the Nazi war machine and when necessary, fight. These quotes are from my students' work at the end of our unit on resistance. They learn about unarmed and armed resistance, partisans and ghetto fighters, as well as those who taught children in secret and stole from camp workshops to make a Hanukkah to light at Hanukkah. Clearly learning about the partisans has a huge impact on my students. Viktor Frankl says the last thing that can be taken from us is the choice of how we respond to or act in a moment. The Belskis made a choice not to not just save themselves, as the top quote states, but to save others as well. Every old Jewish woman saved is a victory against Hitler. I'd like to read the bottom one, beautifully written by an eighth grader last year. I visualize the heart of humanity as a something pulsing light. It dims, but is never fully extinguished. Over time, dark cosmic cracks have appeared in the outside. Often there are scars that split from one side to another. One in particular is deep, way down into the heart of humanity. That fissure is the Holocaust. It is the murder of six million Jews and six million more. However, something fascinating would happen to the crack every so often. The fissure would still expand, but then a little piece of it would glow again. That part of the scar wasn't quite gone. The line was still there, but the light had returned to the dark. I believe each partial healing to be an act of armed, spiritual, 
or religious resistance. Each time someone showed a part of humanity, the heart of humanity reacted. The heart will never be perfect. There are scars and fissures beyond repair, but there are bleak areas that will glow from time to time. This glow is a result of a person doing what the partisans and Jews and many others did during the Holocaust. Fix humanity, make the world a better place. Over 1,200 Jewish souls walked out of the Nalabaki forest on July 10th, 1944. Over 1,200 worlds saved. Learning this gives young people hope and inspiration that quite frankly, I hope they never have to actually use, but will work to continue to instill in them. L'chaim. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's so nice to see the, the cup <laughs> which we made a symbol of our union. <laughs> I, I have Thank to tell you, tomorrow, Tamar, Tamar yeah. um, talking about perspective, um, when uh, COVID began a little over two years ago, and I was in my house and about to begin teaching remotely and going into quarantine and lockdown, um, one of the things that sat at my workspace in my home was that Belsky Partisan Cup. And I would tell myself when I was feeling whatever about our current situation, at least I'm not sleeping in a Zemlyanka in the Polish woods in the winter. And, and it was good to have perspective and realize I was pretty darn comfortable and I'd be okay. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, these illusions, this connection uh, of what happens to us, in our everyday life and in our society today to what happened to them uh, makes it easier for us to live, yeah. to survive today. That's for yeah. sure. That's my feeling too. Thank you very much. Th I thank everybody uh, for sharing your hearts with us because it's not only stories, it's your hearts. I can feel everybody like, like we are sitting all together in one room. Well, uh, do we have any questions? I'm asking our audience to our speakers. Please, if you have questions, you can write into your chat. Um, we have Artur with us now. Yes, Who hi everyone. With questions, yes, please. Yeah, I've got, I've got one, I've got one comment, um, and I'm going to read it to you. We need to actually make a decision uh, from Sharon Renard. Uh, Hello, I'm Tuve's granddaughter. I have a 90 second audio clip of Tuve's words discussing going into the woods. I originally compiled the clip to play in the Naliboki forest when we were there to commemorate the 75th anniversary of liberation, but there was no, there was, but there was so much activity going on that day that we didn't have uh, the chance to play it. I can play it today over my microphone if it feels like something that people would be interested in hearing today, if there is time. Otherwise, some other time. Thank you. Um, I think, Sharon, that 90 seconds is something that is available and we would love to hear it. So um, I'm sure everybody's shaking their head to, mm -hmm. to, to hear that. So. <laughs> Why yes. Ah, so, uh, and while Sharon is preparing, may I ask one question? The question is to Nance. Nance, you were wearing a t-shirt with a portrait of Zeus Belsky. Mm -hmm. Why Zeus? Why Zeus? Why um, did you choose well, Zeus? Well, so Zeus is, so the, the t-shirt is from Jewish Partisan Education Foundation. Um, and they gave me the t-shirt the first time I learned about the Belskis. I can't remember how I won or earned the t-shirt at the workshop. So that t-shirt's 12 or 13 years old. Um, I think you'll have to ask Robert why it's Zeus on the t-shirt instead of Tuvia, because he told me the story. Um, at, but um, I was very excited to get to wear my Belski t-shirt in, in the Belski camp. I wear it every year on Yom HaShoah Ubuvura. Um, and um, and I'm and very happy to get to wear it. Well, okay. okay. Hello to Elizabeth Foyt from Bella. I'll see you on Friday. Okay. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> okay, Sharon, are you are yes. you ready? Yes, I am ready. 
and I hope this, you can hear it okay. Hi, Shash. When they begin to take the juice, like lint, put them in ghettos. I've been knowing ghetto is the end. Let's be careful. He has to organize something. I've been sitting in the woods and I've been calling people should come. And I make a request. Ladies, kids, old, young, you'll find it for everybody bread, for everybody place. We must organize a little power. And we will try. <coughs> Maybe we will have a little success. We will see more, more people. We will try to fight. When this was happening, we find the places in the woods and we find the places where we can stay there. We can sleep outside. We must learn to sleep outside if somebody doesn't know. I'm, I've been born outside. I know how to sleep outside. And we begin to talk with Jonas. We have to call people from the city. And I have such a name to tell to the people which are coming to me. They should know that I am not laughing from them. And I know what I'm doing. We are not afraid because we have nothing to lose. Sharon, was it Tuvia? Yeah. Speak. Yes. Could you, could, you guys, could you guys hear it okay? Yeah, yeah, it was good. Yeah, yeah it was Tuvia. Yeah, that's a compilation of, I've just been collecting family archival materials and that's a little compilation I made. Wow, thank you. It was so powerful to hear him. Wow. So I wanted to play it when we were in the woods and maybe when we turn it into a memorial, we can play his words in that space. I think that would be Yes. Good. So we have the first exhibit for our future memorial. We have two years speaking there in the <laughs> Wow. And about the forest. Uh, Tamara, I have a, a recording that my son and I did a few years ago for of Pinic Baldo, uh, may he rest in peace. He was probably the last partisan in Israel that died recently. We we're very close to him and to his wife and children. Uh, he's speaking in Hebrew, however. So if we can get some of that translated, you may be interested because he had some very, he was a young partisan, probably one of the youngest. Uh, he was about 15 during the war, plus or minus. And he was very active and uh, we all loved him. And he had a lot to say about the Belskis and the forest and the whole situation. So we'll try to get it translated. Yes, we need to translate. But you know, to have uh, someone speaking Hebrew in the forest is also oh, good. Yeah, yeah because the Jews from Novogrudog, they, they could speak Hebrew. They, they loved Hebrew. Yeah. Uh, yeah. As, uh, as, as he said, they loved to sing Russian songs in the forest. Yes. <laughs> but they love to joke in Yiddish, I'm sure of it. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah uh, and they could speak Hebrew. <laughs> okay, good idea. Yeah. Okay. There was a, I want to say, to say something about the Tarbut school. There was a, a school that taught Hebrew in Novogrudek, and yeah. we visited Tamara, I think you took us there. Yeah. Uh, in the center of the city, there was there was a Twanta, of course, it doesn't exist for many years, but at a time my mother went to school there and her brothers really? as well. And they studied Hebrew in Hebrew. Oh. It was a big yeah. chain of schools, of Hebrew schools, all around uh, Vilna and everywhere in Eastern Europe, and a very good one. You know, they had seminars for teachers, for Hebrew teachers. It's, it was a big institution. And it uh, happened also, it, it took place in uh, Novogrodek. Big shtetl Novogrodek. <laughs> the school was named after Chaim Balik. Oh. Chaim Balik. Okay. Chaim Balik. 
Uh, Alright. Right. Uh, we we have another question, but I'm just trying to find uh I mean there's a nickname, maybe maybe a person can speak and introduce himself. It's Pike L N Y B. Um I don't know who the person is. There is no name on there, just a nickname. So mm -hmm. if if we know who this is, let us know. Shout out. So Brian Pickelny. Oh. Um, is asking the questions. Can you can you talk about the Isaacs Einsatzen group? Um, the the SS did, group. Einsatzen group that did the the, the massacre in Nova Grudok. Uh, my father's entire family were murdered in the first massacre in Skirdleve. Were any Isaacs group and. Um, tried for war crimes and were there Ukrainian Belarusian collaborators with that? I think Tamara you're an expert on this. Yes, <laughs> the question is mine. Well, um, Einsatzgruppen were the first who arrived and operated here in the first months of the war, 1941. Uh, we don't know for sure but probably 52 people, 52 Jews who were killed in the marketplace in Novogrudok in July 1941 were killed by such a group, a unit from the Einsatzgruppe. What concerns Skrid Levo, that mass killing in December 1941, this was done by Lithuanian police. Uh, the Germans, um, Oh, they just surrounded the town and surrounded the place. They guarded the place and didn't let anybody leave the town, but they didn't kill. The Lithuanians did it. The second massacre on August 7, 1942, was done by Estonian police. This was uh, battalion number 36 from Estonia, which arrived in Novokrudok. Mm -hmm. uh, this was July 1942. And they carried out massacres in the whole area, Zhetl, Novogrudok, uh, other places. That was their aim. Uh, the liquidation of the ghetto was in February 1943. Lithuanians and Latvians did it. And the last massacre, when 250 people were killed on May 7, 1943, this was done by local police. Who were those local policemen? I don't know. Thank you, Tamara. Mm. We've got another uh, question from Fern Zager. Uh, my father fought with Abba Kovner in the Rudnitsky mm. forest and often talked about the Belskis. Can you talk a bit about the relationship of the various partisan groups? Mm. Well, um, Belskis were part of Soviet partisan resistance and they were cooperating and were in contact with Russian and Belarusian partisans who operated in the same area. I'm not sure the Belskis uh, were in contact with partisans in Lithuania where, where Abba Kovner uh, had his group, but it is incredible how news traveled from place to place mm -hmm. during the wartime, during that time. Somehow they knew about what was going on in faraway places. Uh, the example is a diary written in the Novogrudo ghetto. The author of the diary gives exact numbers of Jews killed in Slonim, 80 kilometers from Novogrudok, Lida, 50 kilometers in other places. Uh, immediately, they knew immediately what happened at where. So, of course, they knew about other partisans. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tamara. Uh, have we got any more questions? I don't see anybody putting the questions in the chat. Anybody wants to ask anything directly? Voice questions, comments before we end our session? If Aaron is still with us, maybe he wants to say something. Henrika, Aaron, are you with us? Probably not. 
Okay. Well, then if anybody want, if anybody else wants to say anything, you're very welcome to raise your hand or put that question or comment in the chat. Otherwise, okay, we've got something in. Uh, Alien Friedman, I would like to thank you for an excellent presentation. My mother was from Mir and joined the Belskis. Thank you very much, Alien. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I would like to, um, uh, oh, there's one more question. Uh, that's another question, that's a comment. Uh, from Larissa, what would the speaker see as the key to a memorial in Naliboki? Wow. <laughs> this is the question to the Belskis. First, you please. <laughs> um. <laughs> Are you asking me, Arthur? No, no, no. no we're, we're asking, asking the Belskis. Belskis. But, Bye, sorry. <laughs> I think I, I think that's I think that's a whole separate Zoom. I think that's a whole <laughs> other. Really, uh... Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Did I did I ask? Too too much of a complicated question, Deborah. There, there's so many um, of them. It wasn't it wasn't sort of like you know a big overarching thing, but it, I was more sort of thinking if there was just one thing that you just really think is important to be represented, just just one thing, kind of what what do you think that 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 might be? And before people answer, let them uh, have thirty seconds to think. Please present yourself, Larissa. Hi. Who you are and where you are from? Ah, hi. Um, am I am I on camera now? Um, yes. Is my camera working? <laughs> yes, great. you are. Hi. Uh, great. Um, so um, I'm Dr. Larissa Rulwork. I'm from the University of Derby, um, and I also um, research about the the Holocaust. Um, and um, I've been very fortunate to recently sort of be involved. Um, in, in at a distance with a project that Tamara has been running with Roman Croak. So uh, it's just been an amazing discussion today. I've enjoyed it so much. It's been so informative. Thank, well, you. thank you. Arthur, I will you repeat back, the question, please? I would be happy to repeat the question, but I think that there's two Jews and three synagogues. I think we're getting into something really <laughs> <laughs> big and long. But um, but yes, the question is was um, what would the speakers or um, anyone else see as a key to a memorial in Naliboki? I don't understand the question. What 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 do you mean a key like a, to the memorial? Like what? a symbol, oh. ask you. a symbol, maybe a tree, um, the trees. I was going to say the trees as that's well. That's what say they I was going to say the trees as well, Bella. I can. I also. I also tr um, have been contributing to the same project that uh, Larissa is working on. And when I sent in the materials to help inform the people on site, it was all about the forest and all about yeah, the trees okay. and the importance of them. Yeah, there's some reason why my son lives in a forest, today, and here <laughs> it is <laughs> for six years. <laughs> Yeah, anybody anybody else um i'll raise my hand if i may mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i just think that it, it's the question is so large that mm -hmm. we all would need some time <laughs> to not only think about it but perhaps to have a discussion somewhere down the line mm -hmm. um where it would do some justice and encapsulate in a small part mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the story, which is such a big yeah. story. And I don't yeah. think that that is something we all have an individual interest, of course, mm -hmm. in what we'd like to see. But I think that uh, we have to look beyond that and make sure that the thing that is the most important is to make sure that whatever we represent is represented in perpetuity again mm -hmm. and is a, a lasting uh, yeah saw, you know a lasting story and the forest is a difficult place to do it in even though it is the story it is a big part mm -hmm. of the story so i think mm -hmm. we you know with me i would i would uh love some time to think about that and i have thought about it from time to time mm -hmm. but because it is so big 
we're going to yeah. crawl instead of uh, <laughs> run. Yeah, I, I think I think I was just sort of struck, Ruth, when you were talking earlier, how you were talking about so passionately about <laughs> authenticity and perpetuity, and that kind of just being that is something I thought that's 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 just sort of two words which just you know strike a really important chord. So I think it was mm -hmm. just that getting that kind of feeling if if that if that makes sense of, of, yes, of what, what's crucial for you thank you thank yes, you yes thank um, you i i mean i don't know i don't know what what my colleagues think but i think that uh it sh definitely should res uh, reflect the spirit of the jews and the jewish community and teach the future generation about that and about the holocaust for it not to happen especially these days the world is is um, going crazy. So I think that's very important to have an education piece in it. I'm sure tomorrow would agree with me. But I like I know it's a huge conversation. I know we might have another like sort of Zoom for three or four hours. Um, to have it on the table. Um, we've got a couple of other questions. Um, let me just see. How did people obtain food from Gary Negan? Um, mm -hmm. uh, what? There were there was a comment from Susan Bach that yes. uh, well they get got food from uh, from food France detail, yeah. from Polish friends but uh, when there were a thousand people in the forest can you imagine how much food they needed and there were several ways to get food uh, first of all they had groups of people who were always on the move collecting food and clothes and bringing back to the forest. Uh, were they getting it from friends only? No. They were getting it from the villages which were allocated for them near Novogrudok and had to travel 40 kilometers back to the forest or both ways. First of all, to get there, to take by force sometimes, and then to bring back to the forest. But uh, they were lucky in a way because during, uh, during that Herman operation, when they had to sit in the swamps for a month, during that operation, the Nazis took away people from the forest. They sent people to forced labor. And because it was summer, the gardens and fields, they, were keep, they kept growing everything, vegetables and potatoes and grain, the wheat and rye was growing. So, that autumn, 1943, was the time of harvest for the partisans. They collected everything they could and uh, preserved for the winter, which was very helpful. Well, they didn't hunt wild animals, that's for sure. I never heard about that. Yes, Asi, please. I want to say that they were mostly hungry. The, mm. This was not yeah. a big restaurant in the in the forest. Mm. Even That's when true. they got food, there was it was not always handed out uh, equally to all people. There's a, one of the of the big stories, and this I really think is something uh, to talk about. Is the part of women? What was the role of women in in the forest? So many women were attached, found um, forest husbands, that's how they, they were called, forest husbands because they were hungry, because they had no coats. And the, the men who went, the, the fighting, the fighters who went uh, for uh, on food missions and collected, uh, found a coat or a pair of shoes, women actually uh, uh, had to, to uh, I don't think it's a sacrifice because they, they, they lived, I mean, all around, every, everything was uh, annihilated, it was, there was death everywhere. So those who lived were glad to be alive, but they, they were hungry and, and, and potatoes saved their lives. But one of the things you were talking about the forest, to me, Belarus is potatoes. Because in potato sheds everywhere, people could <laughs> hide. People who ran out, who got out of the ghettos, had to hide someplace before they got to the to the 
woods before they got to the Bielskis. They had to hide. They used to hide, uh, Gentiles used to hide Jews in, in, for, in, in the potato uh, sheds. And also uh, Belinka, uh, our cousin and Ruti, our mm. cousin uh, Bella, Bella yeah. Dinchowski was yes. hidden in a potato in, in a potato cellar, cellar. Under, the, yeah. under the kitchen with a Polish woman because she spoke Yiddish and they Yiddish. wanted her to forget how to, she was two years old, she already spoke fluent Yiddish. This uh, Polish woman took her, sat with her in the potato yeah. cellar so that she would forget to speak uh, Yiddish and start talking like Polish, you know? Yes. And, and this was, uh, I think potatoes to me, you know, in Vilna, I, when, when they were shooting Defiance, I came to, uh, I went to Vilna with my sister and uh, we found this restaurant that had seven different um, uh, yes. ways yes. to make potatoes. And we had a <laughs> potato meal, potatoes for first, second, et cetera, et cetera, in seven different ways of cooking. And I think the person who would write a book about the partisans should really take <laughs> potatoes into consideration. It's a very important part Thank of you. our lives. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you so <laughs> much. Right. Thank you so much for your comments and questions. I know I know we've been going for for, for a couple of hours and I know that it, everybody is tired. And actually I think we should save uh, comments and stories and questions for another uh, 25 okay. times that we're gonna meet. Uh, hopefully I hope we'll meet again. Forever. I think it should be like a long series of our meetings. I agree. Um, so I would like to uh, give a floor to Deborah to conclude. And thank you so much to everyone for uh, joining us. And please, please, please do join us in the future. And let's continue and develop um, our conversation uh, heading towards uh, the memorial in Nalevoki. Thank you. Debra. Thank you, Artur. Thank you, everyone. Um, I just want to conclude uh, by saying uh, that we will be talking about stories and creating opportunities for you to log your stories with us, but that's all for the next session. Um, I would like to thank uh, Tamara, Shifra, Artur, my very valued team, our wonderful, wonderful speakers. It is such a privilege and an honor uh, to be able to have you here um, and for your very wise and insightful and amazing uh, words. Um, I would just like to share my screen once more um, just to give you a, um, a testimonial actually that was given to us um, uh, very recently. Um, let me just uh, go on to here. Uh, this is from um, uh, Victor Sorensen, who is the director of the um, uh, the AEPJ, the European Association for the Preservation and Promotion of Jewish Heritage and Culture, um, uh, uh, who are um, building the Jewish cultural heritage route across Europe as part of the Council of Europe, who wrote to me recently and said, we support our partners in the Together Plan, whose work is a reference in every sense and a source of inspiration for our European network. Not only their challenge is even greater due to the political circumstances in Belarus, the only country on the entire European continent that is not a member of the Council of Europe. The Together Plan's work in safeguarding rich Belarusian Jewish heritage is bottom-up and cross-cutting approach to heritage management, led by a wonderful team of people, deserves every possible opportunity for support. They are a beacon for heritage practitioners in Europe. And I'm very proud of that. Um, I'm very proud to be associated with everybody here. Um, and I would just like to say thank you to everybody again for participating, for your knowledge. Um, I look forward to our next session. Um, more information will follow shortly. Um, and just to say, have a wonderful evening, day, whatever time zone you're on. <laughs> Seeing you at our next session. Good night. Leap out. It was so, so nice to meet all of you. I <laughs> hope we'll meet in real, in the Nalibuki Forest, Novokrudok and Nalibuki again. Our Ford and Tamara, stay safe. Bye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you everyone. Bye. Take care. Bye.
Thank you. It's been <laughs> really you. good seeing you. Bye. 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 Ruthie, Ruthie, I'll see you soon. I'll see you soon. I'll see you soon. I Bye. bought a present for the baby. <laughs> for Brenda's baby. <laughs> this is like real juice. Say goodbye. And have oh. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> I'm going, to, so. I'm going to close down the Zoom room now. <laughs> okay. We have another Zoom session, which we're about to start. So oh, wow. take okay. care, everybody. Thank you very much. Bye. Nan, send your email address. I said, I'll, I'll send it to you, uh, Bella. I put it in the, in the message.